we're now recording. Um, yeah, so this is a pretty full agenda today. Um, we have basically three things that we want to go over. Uh, first are some of the pending changes in 034 that have already been <laughs> implemented, but we want to revisit. Um, the second one uh, was raised by Chris Goes a couple days ago around evidence handling across restarts and upgrades and how that impacts IBC and if there's anything we can or need to do on the tournament side. Um, and then finally, uh, we're going to talk about the consensus issue that caused this uh, security issue uh, earlier this week. And Bucky is going to talk to us about how he debugged it. Um, that's a pretty full agenda. So I'm going to time box each one to um, between 30 and 45 minutes, depending on um, how that goes. And we'll take a break in the middle if, uh, if necessary. OK, shall we start? Yes. Let's talk about these pending changes. Um, first is events hashing. Yes. Um, so uh, does everyone know why, uh, why this is serviced as, like, uh, as a concern? Can you just uh, go over in a couple sentences? Sure. So basically, the um, so until now, the events were net were not hashed, uh, and so events are have actually been like a major hook for integrating against, and they have been uh, they have never really been stable. So they have been always changing and improving, um, and they're also now they're they're this is even more important for IBC because they're a major hook against which the relayer integrates. Um, and the thing is with events, we don't always, what's, what's happened in the past is we haven't always been clear on exactly how they should be structured um, because we learn more as people try to integrate against them uh, about what people want out of the events. And, you know, because the events don't contain a full suite of information, usually they contain just enough information for you to have, for you to then go and query, you know, with an ABCI query for the rest of what you need out of the state. Um, but the, the concern is that because events are, you know, have been expected to be able to change, um, to be improved through the sort of faster feedback. Uh, they they have been purposely left out of the out of the hash so that um, those changes could be made without breaking the blockchain. Whereas now, if you make a change to the events, um, then it means it's a breaking change to the blockchain, and you know you can't sync uh, across that uh, event change. So in order to preserve that sort of agility, given that, you know, given the number of things happening on the SDK side, for instance, and the, the overhead that would be imposed by trying to say, look, we need to get all the events perfectly into the state we're going to want them, uh, you know, indefinitely or until we're willing to make another breaking change, um, seems like a lot to put on them right now and is maybe uh, not actually feasible given that we don't always necessarily know exactly what the, what the, what we need out of the events. Um, so yeah. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, so I talked to crypto.com and Oasis labs. Um, I haven't heard back from foam, um, but crypto.com and Oasis labs like want this change. Um, they're actually for it. Yeah, but um, what do they want? Why do they want it? Because um, for Oasis, um, their use case was like, you don't have to fetch the entire block with the light client to verify that the events were um, created. And why are they trying to verify events? Um, they didn't specify. I mean, I, I talked to, I told them both the circumstances of like, this will be a consensus breaking change if you do change an existing event. Um, and Oasis is, wants to treat events as consensus breaking. Um, changes and with crypto.com as well. Is Oasis so using the SDK? Excuse me? Is Oasis using the SDK? No. No. Th these are all non SDK users. Very interesting. The, what is the the SDK is kind of the only person that is kind of flimsy with events. Uh, what is Oasis using? They wrote their whole stack. Um, yeah, they wrote an entire like stack. In Go, it's like an EVM thing, right? Uh, no, uh, it's way more complicated than that. Um, I I don't have like it. it it's like some Go, some Rust. Like it's a bit. It's a whole big like you know many engineer project. 
Yep. Yep. So, um, okay. Very well, interesting. Yeah. I, 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 I have some like, like thoughts that build off of this. Um, basically that, you know, the SDK doesn't use, so making events verifiable, like white client verifiable, um, I think creates a bunch of new use cases for the event system um, that, uh, uh, you know, clearly already, you know, we have two people, two projects that are like either interested in or uh, actually think this is like a near term priority for them. Um, the SDK doesn't, as far as I know, have any uh, uh, intention of using these for use cases. Um, one question that I've been having is, would it be possible to set this in the genesis, um, whether or not you are going to hash events into um, the app hash and then use that as like a parameter? So like theoretically, an, app could, an application can disable it uh, in genesis or turn it on. So that's what I was going to ask. We can make it configurable. If it's configurable, does that mean that there is like a something that is divergent in the spec? This would be, I think, the first instance of configurable, um, like data core data structure, uh, configurable hashing, essentially. Yeah. That makes me a little bit nervous. Yeah, I mean, the reality is like, this is a strong feature that everyone is that, that it does create nice new use cases that ultimately everyone should want and benefit from. And probably even IBC, we're going to find ways that IBC is going to benefit from this because it's going to mean one blockchain can verify another blockchain's events. And who knows what, what that will enable in terms of new, um, new opportunities because events are actually, they might, it might actually be cheaper to verify events than it is to verify something in state um and we'd be able to we'd be able to take advantage of that it might you know reduce uh storage costs and it, all kinds of nice things could come from this um but it's not clear that the sdk is going to be in a position anytime soon to take advantage of that and so you know either we either we delay the feature and push the sdk for it and and you know for oasis and and uh and crypto, they have to wait. I mean, I, I would be super interested to understand precisely what their actual use case is right now, like concretely, I think it would be really informative. Um, it's not too surprising that they have one and that, you know, they think this is valuable. It's, it's obviously a valuable feature, but, uh, and then we could try to, you know, make sure this is on the SDK's roadmap to be, to be prepared for it. Or, um, or we, try to make it configurable and work through the concerns with configurable core data structures, which is, I think, I think yeah. there's one other configurable option. Can you guys hear me? Okay. There might be some yep. background. I got stuck in a cafe after coming in in the morning and it started pouring. Um, we could have a subset of event types, uh, either specified per event or specified as a subset in some config be hashed which would allow new events to be added without breaking things, but would allow people who want all of their events hashed to have them be hashed. I don't know if that's too much configurability, but at least it would avoid like hashing or not hashing. So we wouldn't have that kind of spec change. So you could, you could fire events that determine for themselves whether they want to be hashed or not hashed. So yes. you could actually have a mix of events, some of which are hashed, some of which are not hashed. And then it's not like the whole feature is on or off, it's on a per event basis. Yes. That actually sounds uh, compelling. That sounds pretty compelling to me as well. Um, what, uh, so even you mentioned sort of like putting this on the SDK's roadmap and making sure that they're aware of it and giving them time to make the changes that they need to make. Do we know what changes those are? Like what would be different with the SDK if they were prepared for this? That we would have to do like a tour through the event system. Well, with Chris's with Chris's proposal, it doesn't matter. Everyone can take their time, and that's exactly. The, I think that's that's why it's so compelling. Is that uh, no one would have to rush, and you'd be able to sort of stabilize your event system as at your own pace. And uh, yeah, 
but um with the SDK, it's like you would have to do a big tour. If you wanted to hash everything, you'd have to do a big tour through the code base, look at all the events, talk to all the users, figure out lots of different flows and make sure that all the events have enough of, enough of what they need um, that they'd be stabilized. But if, if we have this per event decision-making, then they could do it at their own pace and figure it out over time. And some things could start, could stabilize immediately and others could, you know, whenever. Yeah. Um. I would say my like the biggest probably reason why events are so unstable in the SDK right now is that um, like events are not types. Um, they are um, just like these sort of like ad hoc log messages basically um, that get emitted um, into the, into the, into tendermint in the SDK. Uh, and so it's like, it, it, it's a little bit, it's like, very awkward to even figure out like what events are emitted in a transactions life cycle. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. Is, built it, the, is it even documented somewhere? Like, is it part of the, no, I don't think it's documented anywhere. Right. Uh, like, uh, the, the work that like I started and, and that Anka finished on IBC events is I, and I think specifically for IBC events, we are, we have either been working on, or I don't know what the status on, because I started this work, but haven't failed, followed through on it. Um, the, the work of like having like a spec for IBC events. Yeah. Uh, yeah but in general, events. Aka is working on that, but I don't know what the status is either. And in IBC RS, like events actually have types. Uh, which is nice. Uh, but I think it, it would be uh, like, I don't think it's, it's like not a priority at all in the SDK, but like, you know, I think it would be nice to migrate the SDK to like some sort of uh, type with an interface that like you invoke, which is like, you know, create an event and then you could like go look at the type and say, oh, okay, this is what fields I expect to be in the event. Uh, instead of just like, invoke send event and then add some random set of fields that are in uh, that are available in the local context where that happened, uh, which is what we currently do. Does anyone have objections? I mean, immediate objections to the per event hashing plan. Okay, so what do we need to do to move this uh, strategy forward? I'm guessing we need at least like a small ADR. <laughs> um, do we need a, a, a spec update? Do we need to move the spec repo before we can do the spec update? <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> uh, what, what are the next steps on, on, on moving forward on this? Um, uh, from so the APCI perspective, we just need to add one field. Um, so for the code changes, it's quite minimal. Um, so how, so how, how would we, uh, wait, where's the proto file now? Oh. In, in slash proto. They're all in proto, eh? Okay. You know, following, uh, proto buff structure, recommended structure. Cool. Um, so the current event type, basically key value index. So we would add, oh no, that's a, that's a attribute event. Yeah. So event. No, you, you, you're, you're right. Part. You're right. Yeah. What's that? What? So they already have a type, right? Um, and the, the, so either we could add a new field um, or we could, yeah, I guess we'd want to add a new field. We don't want to read this out of the type as something. Uh, yeah. So I think we should write a small, um, I don't think this needs like a, a, you know, a spec first, it's just going to be changes to the existing spec. So maybe just a small ADR to describe what the change would look like and how it would impact things. And then we could update the specs accordingly. And then um, I guess probably the thing to do would be to add a field to the, to the event message, to the ABCI event message. Um, I don't know what to call it, something to hash or I don't know, ask the Bitcoiners for a clever name that no one will understand. And, uh, and then, yeah, you would just switch on that and hash those in.
how does the event hashing work? Does it build a tree? Like what's going on? Yeah, it's a Merkle tree. How is the tree sorted? Does anyone know? In order? FIFA? I think it's in order of the uh, of how they came in. But I actually haven't reviewed this as we go. Okay, so I think we have a good how, outcome. How does the, the, the hashing works right now? So right now it, it is not a tree, just like a hash of the broader encoded events. It's a hash of the whole list of them? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh. Um. Is a hash of all of them going to help? Like, does that fit uh, Oasis's and Crypto.com's use case, or do they like? I would, I would expect they want a, a tree. Yeah, it sounds like they, you know, for most use cases, you would want uh, O log n. Uh, proofs instead of ON proofs. Yeah. Okay, well, perhaps right, well, that should also be updated or addressed in the, the small update ADR that's forthcoming. Yeah. Um, and we can make sure to send that to Oasis uh, and whoever else and make sure that it will meet their needs. Sound good? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, let's move on to evidence handling across restarts and upgrades. Uh, so Chris, can you give a quick overview of the issue at hand? Yes. So on the IBC side of things, we have been working to minimize the user disruption uh, of most potentially all planned upgrades. By planned upgrades, I mean what we've done so far in the Cosmos Hub, when a chain knows it is going to upgrade in advance, um, it knows when it is going to upgrade, and it upgrades and restarts, changing the chain ID and potentially changing the height. Uh, in IBC, we can, uh, we, what we want in IBC is to preserve channels because that preserves tokens and because then users don't have to do anything across upgrades. We can do that if we can virtualize a sort of continuous like client verification across the upgrade. So if the chain basically signals ahead of time that it's going to upgrade to this new chain ID and new height, and it signals when it's going to happen, it's the last time in the old version, then the light clients which are following that chain can incorporate those updates and automatically switch. Uh, that's sort of a high level summary, but the details of that don't actually matter. The part which matters for Penderman um, is that in order for that to be safe, IBC requires that the um, usual uh, uh, fault accountability guarantees and unbonding period are preserved across this sort of light client virtualization because there's no guarantee that everyone will um, you know, hear about the upgrade at the same time. So if a chain decides it's going to upgrade, uh, you know, in a week it writes something to state, uh, but the unbonding period is three weeks, so some light clients might not hear about the upgrade until after it's happened. Uh, and if there are, you know, validators presumably still have their old keys, so if they uh, sign a block, um, you know, just like the upgrade didn't happen, then now the light client can be fooled, uh, particularly IBC-like clients, and there's no sort of fork accountability or punishment. Unless Tendermint, after an upgrade, can keep around enough state, I guess this is just mostly signatures, um, so that you know, for at least the unbonding period, evidence can be submitted after the upgrade um, to slash um, uh, validators if they committed uh, misbehavior with respect to the upgrade definition. So by misbehavior with respect to the upgrade definition, I include um, two categories. The first is just you know the usual double signing, just on an old height before the upgrade, um, or you know other kinds of attacks. But the second is also signing a height past the stated upgrade height, uh, because that um, can also fool an IBC light client. So if the chain says it's going to upgrade height 100, um, uh, we also need or IBC the IBC security model also requires that we uh, consider as a fault signing block 101 if we're doing a zero height upgrade. Does that make sense? Because otherwise it would just be normal misbehavior. 
So on the SDK side, we have all the relevant state because we're presuming that state is preserved through the upgrade. So we can still slash the validators as long as Tendermint uh, tracks the evidence. But the part which I you know, don't know, hence uh, bringing it to this call, is in what state Tendermint keeps after an upgrade, if any, and whether Tendermint will accept old evidence uh, you know, from the unbonding period from the past chain uh, and send it to the SDK so the validators can be slashed or other sorts of work accountability. Does that summary make sense? So this is really messy. I, I kind of have like a naive question um, here. What if like someone does um, a malicious behavior, um, let's say five minutes before the upgrade and then not all the nodes receive like half the nodes on dump state have evidence in their genesis in their new genesis and half of them don't evidence won't make it into genesis unless it's in unless it's part of the consensus so <clears throat> if if some nodes had seen it it'll be in their mempool they'll be, they'll try to get it into a block once it's in a block everyone's going to have it in their state oh, okay okay good right, question. That, Go ahead. that doesn't actually help because the misbehavior could well be, uh, could well take place after the upgrade. So like validators could sign an old height, for example. Uh, so here's a naive question, but what information, what state is persisted across upgrades? In Tendermint or in the SDK or what? Uh, let's say in Tendermint. I don't, I don't remember nothing, right? You just start from zero. Consensus parameters and some minor stuff. It's just the genesis. Okay, yeah. And what gets persisted from the SDK? The whole state. So okay. the, the entire application state is dumped into the genesis file. Right, but that right. doesn't I mean, necessarily, that doesn't by, that doesn't include evidence. It doesn't, well, it doesn't include like the blockchain. It doesn't include like signatures and headers. Um, and so we can't, uh, so Tendermint wouldn't have, if deleted its database, it wouldn't have the information necessary to actually detect future evidence. Right, I mean, the sort of underlying reason we have this messy problem is that Tendermint and the SDK are making different assumptions about what an upgrade is. The SDK assumes that all state is persisted, Tendermint does not. And then we have this evidence like, evidence handling split across both of them, uh, which then gives us this problem. I mean, we could like do radical alterations to the SDK, have the SDK keep all the state, and then the SDK could handle the evidence by transaction. Um, that's one radical option. The other radical option is that we could require that upgrades freeze IBC for three weeks. We could require that upgrades declare in advance at least three weeks that they're going to upgrade, and then IBC would be on basically scheduled downtime until the upgrade happens for those three weeks. That doesn't strike me as likely to be popular, but it is possible. Apart from that, I can't think of a safe way. Well, the other, the other is, <clears throat> another way potentially to do it is a non, uh, it depends what we're talking about, I guess, because if, if we're talking about upgrading um, uh, the app and not Tendermint, it's conceivable that we could do a non-zero height upgrade, in which case Tendermint will keep the data around. Ah, uh, right, right, right. Yeah, I guess those are the only solutions I see other than solutions where Tendermint keeps the data around. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the, where it's going to be really hard is if Tendermint needs to upgrade. Um, because especially if, you know, we change something in the header or whatever, uh, or the signatures, you know, um, because now all the clients also are going to break and now the data we have to keep around, we're no longer going to be compatible with. Um, so we'll need to actually keep around the old data structures in code as well. Um, which is, I mean, ultimately, I think we want to move the code base towards a direction where it's possible to do that. And we can like run the same software across a version upgrade, which would be, uh, which would probably help with a lot of this and, and the data would still be around, but Yeah.
I mean, it could be that, uh, Chris, uh, did, did you mention the possibility of just like getting everyone to close out all the channels before an upgrade? Yeah, I mean, the problem with that is the way IBC is written means that before you close channels, you have to, you know, send tokens back or something. Like, it's a huge coordination problem because you have all this, uh, you know, orphan state basically on chains. And if you're going to do a close everything sort of upgrade, you need to move all the state to, you know, in the case of tokens, you need to move them all back to the source chain um, so it doesn't get stranded. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could, we could give up on the sort of current uh, aim of the IBC upgrade system, which is to allow upgrades without sort of user um, or end user application interaction. If we give up on that, then we can do something like close all the channels, that's true. Maybe that's like what we have to do now. Um, I'm just trying to sort of lay out the options. Mm -hmm. We're also talking about a, uh, a change in chain ID, right? Yes. That's gonna wreak havoc on everything as well. Right, I mean, the way we, uh, I kind of said this, but it, as a sort of a conceptual model, I think it helps to, to think about it. The way we are doing these smooth upgrades on IBC is by faking a like client that works across the upgrade, right? Like we're doing some stuff in the like client um, that IBC runs to change these parameters. Um, uh, so it's kind of a, it's a simplicit assumption that in fact there is a single consensus instance. It's just changing these parameters. But that's not uh, at the, the like moment. Clients, the like clients are also going to need to be able to deal with the evidence across upgrades, right? Like the new client on in the upgraded IBC will need to be able to verify evidence from the old chain pre the upgrade. Right. That's right. Um, we are already working on that. That's not so hard on the SDK side. Can I we'll ask just keep a the old question? Go ahead. Is it is it is it possible to run like both state machines for 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 the duration of the unbonding period? Like for three weeks, you run two tendermint instances. That's an interesting question. There are actually a lot of arguments in favor of that kind of upgrade model. It's just so different than the one we have at the moment. Like, because then, you know, wh what is the canonical token source for those three weeks? Um, and then you need to do upgrades over IBC where you have like people gradually move their tokens over or something, which I think is actually a great design direction, but it's probably even harder than any of the options we're considering here. I imagine that would probably also be unpopular with validators. That might be true. Not that that's a make it or break it kind of factor, but just something to consider as well. Mm -hmm. Chris, I liked your assessment of sort of like the root cause of this being a discrepancy between Tendermint and the SDK in terms of like what it means to upgrade and reset, but I don't know what to do with that. Like, it sounds really like I think you're right, and that is the the root cause. But I don't know how to like take that and either um, uh, resolve that that discrepancy or or what a good workaround would be. So it it sounds to me like um, the only reason we do upgrades this way is just because we don't want to, like maintain backwards compatibility with like data structures. Uh, is that really the, is that sort of the only reason why we need to have these sort of upgrades where we reset the whole chain? Like, if we were to preserve backwards compatibility with like previous data structures, um, would there, would there no longer be like any use case for doing these kinds of uh, uh, forks? Yeah, I think that's true. These kinds of upgrades are also arguably bad for other reasons, namely. There's not really continuity with the old chain, although we're starting to try to fake that here. I guess we're already going in that direction. But if users want to, say, do accounting from the Cosmos Hub since Genesis, figure out how much the validator, validator got paid each month or something, right now this has become very hard to do. They have to download like four blockchains. 
right? So we've just offloaded the problem of data structure compatibility onto our users, more or less. Yeah. Um, so is it viable for us to like maintain backwards compatibility though? Uh, because it sounds like once we get to like 1.0, we're going to have to do that at some point anyway, right? Just, just so I can be sure we're talking about the same thing. In a model where we maintain backwards compatibility across both the SDK and the Tenderman, we would just, um, you know, upgrades would potentially change the state machine and change Tenderman, but they wouldn't touch any data. We would retain the ability to read and process all of the old data structures. Is that right? So there would yeah. be no zero height upgrades, no, not even necessarily a chain ID change. Um, it would just be some like, scheduled state machine switch. Yeah, you will at some point just like switch the Tendermint nodes over from the old version to the new version and just retain all the data and, and be able to still process that. And to be clear, making that change is like on our to-do list and, and coming down the pipeline for the Tendermint team. So investing in that is not, you know, that's something that we want to do soon anyway. Um, my question is just like what... Mm, I don't know exactly when that will happen. And so I don't want this to be like a blocker for uh, IBC, or at least we should make sure that we have all of like the building blocks or, or, or kind of stepping stones uh, ready to go in 034 such that we can do this in the next release. release. Uh, Eric, just a minor question on what you, you said. Um, did you cover the case of when someone is syncing from Genesis? So it's like you switch the node um, at a certain height for the upgrade, but then if someone wants to sync from Genesis, do they have to run the old Tendermint and then in the code base we're switching? Yeah, I'm not really sure of like the details here, but the way I would see it is sort of that the, uh, the old block structure will still be used. Like if you spin up a new Tendermint node with like a new version, it will sort of receive all the old blocks and be able to like parse those and process those and store them in like the old format uh, and then also process blocks in a new version. Uh, the downside of course is that we would sort of have to retain backwards compatibility with like all versions of blocks back to Genesis, uh, which is going to be a pretty heavy maintenance burden over time. So we probably want to be pretty, we probably want to have very stable data structures before we go down this route. I'm just going to plug uh, Sean's idea of the spec repo right now. Yeah, uh, I guess what we could do though is that we, we could sort of, um, I guess when we're spinning up a new node that's running a new version, that node could conceivably convert like the old blocks into like new on this data structures and stuff with some sort of like compatibility layer. So you would able to you would be able to sort of migrate the whole chain onto a new version of the data structure by just gradually replacing all the nodes and like syncing from Genesis, maybe. There are a lot of options here, but, um, but, but I think sort of conceptually over time, we really just need to be able to like keep all historical data around for like however long people need it. Yeah, I mean, I guess my, that sounds wonderful. Uh, my sort of operative question is, is there any possibility that Tendermint can handle evidence across upgrades in 034? Or do we need to assume the answer is no and sort of make whatever additional assumptions or relax the light client security model and tell people not to send tokens three weeks before upgrades or like, sort of, do we need to assume that that won't happen from the perspective of IBC? Yeah, I, I don't really know what sort of the timeline here will be. Like, like, is there even a quick fix we could do that will allow us like retain evidence uh, in the current model? Um, I'm not really sure. And uh, maybe Anton could speak to this. I guess he's more familiar with this than I am. Yeah, I don't know. So, like, the 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 problem I see is that. So let's say you, you copy that, uh, you preserve the ev evidence, or you even you can even monitor, like uh, doll chain somehow. 
the, the old evidence doesn't apply for for new chain because it, it has a new chain ID. It's like you 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 probably can't punish validators for 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 something they did for something they did with the previous like on another blockchain basically because this is another blockchain so like you're punishing them for something they did on another blockchain even though they have like the same private key and public key yeah so you're punishing uh, them like for something completely different yeah um so <clears throat> the just just to clarify a few points here are we talking about so what are the cases where where these kinds of zero height upgrades happen is it um like is it is it something where like the there's a breaking change in the sdk uh that could trigger this or is it only um a breaking change in tendermint so far we've done zero height upgrades for all cosmos hub upgrades in the past yeah for the sdk yeah. but with the upgrade module does that is that also based on zero height my understanding is that the up, maybe Bez can answer better here, but my understanding is no. So we would, if with the upgrade module, we'll only need zero height for tendermint breaking change. Is that right, Bez? That's correct. So, so what we're talking about are really just if tendermint makes a breaking change, then we need a zero height upgrade. Yeah. Okay. So that reduces the, the scope of the problem a little bit, which is good. Yeah. Uh, oh, that also reduces the scope in the sense that uh, during the Stargate process, we won't be doing a zero height upgrade. We will be doing just a upgrade module upgrade. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. That helps. I mean, Tendermint upgrades are maybe rare enough that for now we could say you have to pause IBC for three weeks before you do one or use only at your own risk. Exclamation point. I wonder yeah. if like something like pause all channels and have a governance vote to, to restart them or something like that or well the, i mean the thing is basically what we're saying like the it's conceivable that by the time we actually need to do a zero height or we could structure i mean so basically the, the nice thing about this is it means it's entirely within the tenement roadmap now right so we could say that look we have plans to make breaking changes to tenement somewhere down the line but we could say we're not going to do them now until we're ready to support a compatible uh, zero height upgrade so that we keep around the old data and we can verify evidence across the, across the upgrade boundary. Um, and then we can, you know, th that can happen at whatever pace is necessary. And basically we don't, you know, we don't get the new tenement upgrade features until we have support for the breaking upgrade. Right, I think that works. So if we do that, um, we don't do anything now. We just add this dependency into the tenement roadmap where either we end up supporting retaining evidence and uh, doing the breaking changes at the same time, or worst case, we have to do this three week delay in IBC, which would be bad, but if it's like once in the history of Cosmos, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Um, aren't there some parallels, am I muted? Uh, yeah, aren't there good. some parallels to how the SDK does this, right? So um, you want the uh, you want the same ability to essentially replay the ledger from Genesis, given that multiple upgrades uh, occurred. Um, and I think through the SDK, you do this through like a sidecar process or something that switches the binaries for you. Yeah. Um, and does the version upgrading. Uh, and then all the actual state changes occur in the in the actual application, right? So like going from 0, 040 to 041, you would have an out of process um, process that changes the binary and then an in process thing that does the state mutations. Um, could a similar process be followed for Tendermint? We can, we can do, we probably it would be the same sort of thing for Tendermint and that's, um, there's actually an old ADR about exactly this, I think ADR 16 or 17 or something. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge is that you need to be able to verify data structures from the previous version in the new version, right? Because you need to be able to receive evidence that's going to contain a signature 
uh, from the old version and you need to know what the header is say from the old version so you can check stuff um, and that's the that's the challenge but now maybe the, mm-hmm. now maybe okay. the migration is going to be like the state migration analog is going to be sufficient and we just um, move everything over into a into something that can be checked but because we're hashing and verifying signatures um, it's not likely that we can just like use the new data structures. We probably need to keep around the old format so that we can actually still verify things. Yeah. Is there, is there anything that, you know, protocol buffers can help here with regards to backwards compatibility? Like with protocol buffers, you're supposed to be future compatible, right? So any, you can handle uh, changes that occur in future versions, but you should also be able to handle uh, previous versions, right? So long as you don't mutate or remove fields. I mean, the problem, the problem is we're, we're verifying signatures and hashes and protobuf isn't really designed for that. Okay. Um, so that's, that's where we need to preserve the actual logic for how you verify, like how you compute the sign bytes and then verify right. the signature on that. Got it. Yeah. You'd have to keep that code around. We'd have to keep some code around. Yeah. Just another architectural consideration note while I think about it, not to stress anyone out too much, but the current way we've thought about cross-chain validation uh, will require that one chain can run the fork accountability protocol for another chain, basically. And this may cause us to want to keep that state um, somewhere else. Or like if, there, if one chain is handling, is basically tracking signatures for multiple chains or at least running the fork accountability protocol, maybe that should be in the application. Does that make sense? Um, Can you say that one more time? Yeah. So um, on the IBC side, we've also been thinking about cross-chain validation and potentially a research group that we've collaborated with before on fork accountability is going to do some work on it. Um, And in some cross-chain validation models, um, one chain needs to handle evidence for another chain, which means it needs to keep all relevant data You cut out there, Chris. Chris, we lost you for a second. We just heard that the chain needs to keep all relevant data, I'm guessing, for the other chain. That cafe internet, eh? Right. But, but can I ask sort of a, uh, a naive question here? Uh, so like when, when we do these upgrades, like would it be possible for the new chain to, to use the light client to fetch the evidence data necessary from the old chain via some archive nodes or something and just point to that in a genesis or something like that? Was that an actual cricket or like a chair? <laughs> maybe maybe it, Anton could sort of elaborate on this and he, he knows both the evidence and the um, you, and you, mean, you mean put evidence into, into the Genesis file? No, I, I just mean when you're doing an upgrade, like could the Genesis file for the new chain sort of have some sort of pointer to what the previous chain was uh, uh, along with maybe a set of RPC servers or something that it could use for uh, for evidence verification via the light client? Like, would something like that be possible? Because then we could sort of fetch the state that we need for, for this evidence handling from an external source and have it verified rather than keeping it on local tenement nodes. Right. Um, I've been talking this whole time. <laughs> yeah, that, that could work probably. So we would definitely need to put stuff in the Genesis file to reference what the old chain is. Um, and the idea of being able to fetch things from uh, another process that we trusted, it makes sense. But uh, I'm not sure if it, uh, if it would work without any changes because we need to, we would need to like verify things about what we fetched. A, we would need to be able to like unmarshal it and work, excuse me, and work with it. And so if it's different data structures, then we're still, we're still facing the same problem. 
there could be a way that we expose an endpoint that is specifically for this, for dealing with this, where we say, you know, all we get back is like the address of someone who did something and, or, or we give the other, no, yeah. We could, we could potentially design something where neither node, where we just uh, like get information about what happened rather than the actual data and assume it's already been verified because we're working with trusted nodes um, and, and figure it out from there. But in the end, the evidence is gonna need to be broadcast to everyone. And so uh, you're still gonna need, you still can't get away from like this sort of data structure problem. Um, yeah, but having well, another node around, an old node around might actually help a little bit. Well, unless this like old node actually also did the job of like converting this evidence into sort of a new data structure format that the new version could, could handle. Like, yeah. So so it depends on like how significant the changes are, but it, it might be feasible. Yeah, but everyone is still going to need to verify signatures. So maybe that means everyone has a old full node and they send a thing and they just like check that it matches something the old full node has in there. Therefore, the signature is verified. Um, so it could be, we'd have to really dive in to see exactly what it would look like. But um I think the, the nice thing is that it, that it sounds like it's within the Tenement roadmap and so that we can, we can work on this um, kind of independently of any other urgency. But it, it wasn't clear what Chris was getting at. I don't know if he's back now, but. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, it's not a concern we need to address today. Uh, just sort of a note that some of the stuff we've been thinking about under the category of cross-chain validation will include one chain handling evidence for another chain. And insofar as the data that's required to handle that evidence is like currently stored within Tendermint in a way that I assume presumes that there's only one chain being tracked, uh, we may want to consider changing that or thinking about how that's structured later on in the cross-chain validation design process. And that may help us with some of these questions, depending on what we choose. Could you have multiple evidence reactors for each of the chains? I don't know. Uh, I'm not proposing any Tendermint architecture changes. I don't, I'm not qualified to do that. Uh, I'm just noting that at least from the sort of high level feature set perspective, it's something we've been talking about. That sounds like it might be good fodder for another conversation at some point with a more targeted group of people. Sounds good. This has answered my questions from the um, immediate IBC side. So thank you very much. Cool. Okay, cool. Um, so our conclusion here, just to make sure we're all on the same page, is that, um, you know, we don't have to worry about this immediately. Uh, this will only really become uh, relevant when IBC is actually doing an upgrade. Um, and at that point, either Tendermint Core will be in a position where it can persist data um, across upgrades and continue to validate data structures from old versions of software, or uh, before the next IBC update, we'll have to stop we'll have to ask people to stop sending tokens uh, within the bonding period before that upgrade. Is that the correct TLDR? Yeah, it's a little more than stop sending tokens. We basically have to completely freeze the light clients, but uh, it's clear. The okay. Clear. Okay. We'll have to ask people to participate in a coordinated unbonding period length right. upgrade right. process. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> Just generalize that a little bit more. Okay, cool. Um, so we have been at this for an hour, so I'm gonna suggest we take a five minute break. Um, and when we come back, we will talk about um, this consensus issue that Bucky debugged uh, last week. Sound good? Okay, see you guys shortly. I'm gonna stop the recording for now. Oh.